to welcome everybody out tonight, those that are here and those that are joining us on Zoom. We, we, we appreciate having everybody here tonight and welcome everybody that's on Zoom. Welcome you folks here tonight and to be with us. And, and our person that's giving our lecture tonight is Kevin Reeves, and that's on organizing our neighborhoods. And we're going to start with just a word of prayer and uh, if everybody join me on that. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to have Kevin here tonight and the knowledge that he has to share with us. We pray that thy spirit will be here with us and be with this great nation, Father, and watch over us and guide us. And we pray for these things. Thank you for the many blessings and do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, welcome. Um, we're going to talk about how to organize your community for a number of reasons, uh, but primarily it's to organize it for uh, life after a failure of civility. And um, I guess the first question I would ask is, do you feel like the last 10 years we have moved more towards civility and, and freedom or maybe more away from it? A long ways. And if that trend continues, we're going to see some interesting things happen. So we're talking about how to organize after an event. The event can be any number of things. Um, it can be a fire, an earthquake. It's got to be widespread for it to be a, a real challenge because otherwise aid will just roll in. Floods, uh, wind storms, winter storms, economic collapse, trucker strike, EMP. Basically, in short, anything that disrupts the delivery of goods and services. Anything that causes that to cease. What the effects will be, will be a loss of electrical power, eventually, maybe immediately. Closing down of all transportation, which means, for example, if there were a trucker strike, we wouldn't be getting fresh produce or food deliveries. The hospitals would end up shutting down because there is no um, supplies delivered. So it's all a matter of, uh, you know, that loss of transportation is a biggie. Because then the hospitals basically become morgues. They serve no purpose, they, um, they can't operate. Hospitals have a two day supply of supplies. After two days, if they're not getting stuff back, they're not, they're not able to service patients. Uh, we'll all be isolated. If, if, if you look at this picture, if that was Highway 18, we're up here, we're stuck. We've been isolated before. Um, a few times. And uh, it's usually very short term, but it's always interesting. Probably the, the most irritating of all is the St. George Marathon. I just can't stand that. <laughs> it drives me crazy. Anyway, so these are the kinds of things we're talking about. So why organize? I do. Because the power of the collective far outweighs the individual. You cannot get one person to chop the wood, tend the fire, prepare the meals, weed the garden, preserve the food, protect the, the, the area, tend to sanitation, tend to the sick and injured, and bury bodies. Even if they have all the skills to do that, one person can't do it all. So we, we have to have a division of labor to ensure that people can, that the work gets done. Now the power of the collective is, I have a, a, an illustration of this. This is a, a story from my past that um, when I w worked at tracker school years ago, we would go in and out of the, our primitive camp in the Pine Barrens and we had a lot of gear to bring in. So we rented a, a U-Haul. It was a 28 foot cargo van, not a moving van, a cargo van. And uh, my buddy Joe drove it in and parked it but he parked it in such a way that there was no way to get that thing out of there. 
their trees were too close to turn. He figured he could pull in and then back out. But when he turned the wheels this way, man, he could only go back so far. He was completely hemmed in. He worked at it for 45 minutes. And I said, well, I got an idea. And I got the class up. I said, there, we had 100 people in this class. I said, I want everybody to go around and get position yourself on the frame of this truck. And, you know, everybody's laughing at me. They're all going, there's no way. You're picking up a, you know, whatever it was. It was several tons, you know, undoubtedly. And moving it. I said, let's see what happens. So everybody grabbed a hold of the flat frame. I said, on three, everybody lift. On three, everybody lifted. And lo and behold, we picked that truck up. We moved it 10 feet and set it back down. Now, there's tremendous power in collective effort. Now there's a, an important caveat with collective effort is that it has to be voluntary. Communism and socialism are non-voluntary efforts. It doesn't, doesn't, you know, you don't get to choose. Whereas in this, we do. Typically societies will break down after an event in fairly predictable ways. They'll go through a five-phase model that we developed over the years watching disasters. And the event doesn't matter. Anything that disrupts the delivery of goods and services. Big earthquake, um, flood washes out the bridges, um, extreme storm. I guess Denver's getting hit with, what, 40 inches of snow today? That would, that would be temporary, but it would be pretty severe. I don't think you're going to see a lot of trucks making deliveries. Probably the Domino's pizza guy ain't going out. So anything that results in this results in extreme competition. Competition over minimal resources and dwindling resources. Resources are going away. So typically we go through five phases. Phase one is what we call the cooperation phase. Phase two, self-preservation, anarchy, tribalism, and then if nothing happens, we get warlords. But let's talk about phase one. Phase one is the cooperation phase. Usually for, for, for the first 24 hours after an event happens, people are out there helping, cooperating, digging through rubble, um, providing aid and comfort, and they're pretty generous with their supplies and time. However, if nothing happens to offer relief, at the end of 24 hours, people start to go, well, you know, I had two cases of bottled water yesterday and I gave all of, half of them away. I've only got one left. I think my family might need that. I'm gonna save that. All right, so we go into phase two, which is self-preservation, about 48 hours. So we're, we're, we're at a point where there's minimal collective effort because people don't have enough to spare. A phrase they, that you hear is, if I give you my food, which of my children gets to go hungry? Good thought, right? I mean, you got, you got to preserve your, your own family first. So self-preservation takes over. If no relief is there, usually after about 72 hours, and I'll, I'll use a couple of examples. Haiti, um, Venezuela has been a very slow descent. They've moved through the first three or four phases over the course of several years, but most of the time it goes really quick. Hurricane Katrina, for example. So phase three is anarchy. And during anarchy, we lose the rule of law. In New Orleans, we have a side business of doing hurricane security. Um, and so I've been in New Orleans after hurricanes and um, NOPD went home. I can't blame them. I got a family to take care of. I'm going to go home and take care of them. You know, I'm not going to defend a police precinct when my family is in danger. So they all went home and there was no rule of law. The resulting anarchy was well beyond anything any of you can imagine. Um, it was clearly every man for himself. Looting and robbery um, on a grand scale. New Orleans and after Katrina, the, the mayor at the time, Mayor Nagin, told the uh, county jail supervisor, open the jail and let everybody out. 
Tell him to come back on Friday. Yeah, that's going to work well. Release on their own recognizance. Well, now you have a bunch of about seven or 800 pretty hardened criminals loose on the streets of, of New Orleans. What did they do? They went to the Walmart and robbed it of guns and started to rain with unbelievable violence. One of our teams uh, came up to a, uh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get into the violent side of it. I can just tell you that without rule of law, people descend into very animalistic behavior. And actually that's degrading to animals. They, uh, they behave insane, insanely, insanely. Um, you know, I often ask people in, in classes, I say, if you knew that no matter what you did, you'd never be held accountable, how would that affect your behavior? Never be held accountable. Most of us have pretty high moral codes that say I, nothing would change. I'd still be the same guy. But there is an element of society who only obeys the law out of fear. And when you take away that fear, they don't obey the law. And that's what happens. Looting, robbery, gunplay. Oh, man. Uh, first night we were there, we heard a couple of gunshots off in the distance. We were protecting a, a, a power company um, encampment where there were about 500 cherry pickers from all over the southeast that had come in from utility companies to help restore the power. They were parked on this 10 acre lot. And first night we heard about, I don't know, maybe a dozen gunshots. Second night we heard lots of gunshots. Third night we heard nothing but gunshots. There were full on firefights, automatic weapons. We could hear AKs going off. AKs make a really distinct sound. And you, you, could, you could hear full auto firefights going on all night long and they were getting closer. It was a little scary for us. Um, lots of gunplay. Without the rule of law, people tend to go crazy. That's phase three. Phase four, oh, let me, let me explain something more about this. There's a, a tactical trainer by the name of Matt Graham, who I, I, I really like this guy. He's a former Marine. I, sh I shouldn't say former, right? He's a retired Marine. He wrote something called the Kill House Rules, Matt Graham. Rule number one is no one is coming to save you. In an anarchic situation, calling 911 isn't gonna help you. There's nobody there. So if nobody's coming to help you, what does that mean? Who's gonna, who's gonna save you? You are. Everything is your responsibility. It's called extreme accountability. There's an inspirational speaker, former SEAL, by the name of David Goggins, who talks a lot about extreme accountability. Don't ever make an excuse. If it doesn't go right, accept responsibility. Number three is save who needs to be saved. And number four, conversely, is kill who needs to be killed. Times will not be nice. Now, I, I've thought a lot about this because there are a number of people that I know who would have a very hard time pulling the trigger on another human. Context is everything. I had a woman in class one time say, I could never, I could never shoot anybody. I could just never do that. I said, let me give you an example and tell me what you would do. You hear screams in the middle of the night, you wake up, and you run to your 14 year old daughter's room and there is a man in the act of raping her, what would you do? You've got a Glock in your hand, what are you gonna do? Oh, I'd shoot him, of course you would, right? There are still people who won't be able to do that. It falls upon the warrior class, the people who've trained their whole lives and have acted 
in that capacity to do that. And they will be there. And number five is always worked a problem. Never stop working. Focus. When I, I, I did a lot of work with the uh, Air Force and um, Marine Corps SEER school, Survival, Escape, Resistance, Evasion. And one of their rules that they had when, and they trained us in, in, in this when I learned from them and then when I taught them um, is always worked a problem. The moment you get kidnapped and thrown in the trunk of a car, start planning your escape. Don't wait to see what happens. Work the problem right now. What's the, the most pressing thing in front of you and work that. That's how, you, that's how you can combat anarchy. There's more to it than that, but that's a good start. Another thing about anarchy is never under any conditions ever, ever, ever go to the Superdome. You know what I mean, right? Superdome had 35,000 people spread all over it. Sleeping, peeing, defecating, there, there were no toilets. There were reports of rape, the reports of murder. I have that from a reliable source, someone who was there. If you think the government is going to take care of you, you've got another thing coming. I remember after Katrina, there were people sitting on the roofs of their houses holding up signs that said, save us. And I just thought, no one's coming for you. Eventually, um, the, the, the local boats, what, what was the name of that group, Jerry? The Cajun, the Cajun Navy. Started pulling people off rooftops, boating them out. It made the government look really bad, so the government didn't like them. Um, but the government is not there for your benefit. I mean, they are there to maintain control, to maintain their power. They don't care about you as an individual. They don't, they just, I mean, if you think they do, you're dreaming. So never depend on the government for aid. The whole idea of being prepared is to give you self-reliance to free you from the control of other people. As long as you are unprepared, then the people who have the, the uh, goods, they will set, set the rules for what those, what those rules are, for what that, you know, how, how to distribute food. If, if you give up control of the food to the government, the government will decide when you eat. If you give up control of your housing, the government will decide where you live. If you give up control of um, any aspect, you give up control of your guns, then none of the others matter because you will be a slave. So preparedness is designed to help you become not a victim. I spent a lot of time talking about victimhood had a conversation with a good friend of mine today, with Jerry and another friend, about how we have gone away from the heroic journey in, in movies and films. He's a movie producer. And, and he says, we've gone away from that to being the hero is the victim. I just want, I, I mean, I thought about it and went, holy cow, that's, that's what's going on. That's what you see on Netflix now. I'm the victim. Poor me. Remember the kill house rules. Nobody's coming to save you. You have responsibility for yourself. So don't depend on the government. If you can, there's a link down there in the bottom to a video. It's a news report that was made the week after the, the Superdome was emptied. And it's a guy walking through with a camera, camera crew, um, looking at the destruction, the carnage. <laughs> wow. It was eye-opening, even for me, having been in New Orleans. 
Phase four, after anarchy for, goes on for a while, people start to realize that there is economy of scale in a group. And so they form tribes. They get together with other people that are like-minded and they use the power of the group to increase their chances of gathering needed resources. Tribalism. Some tribes are already made. California, Los Angeles County has 10 million people. In Los Angeles County, there are 22,000 sworn police officers for 10 million people. In LA County, there are 180,000 gang members. Who do you think is going to rule the roost there? The cops? I wouldn't bet on it. Tribes tend to form with people that are like them. So that ends up meaning people with this, of the same social class, people of the same race or ethnicity, the same backgrounds and origins, same religion. That's how the tribes get formed. And so tribalism uh, makes it hard because you're going to have to contend with other tribes for control of resources. That's phase four. If no help ever arrives, if nothing is reinstituted, military doesn't show up, then you end up with what happened in Mogadishu, where you have warlords combining tribes to form fiefdoms. Charismatic leader will unite several tribes and have even greater economy of scale. <coughs> the tribes are actually assimilated without choice. You are now part of us. Welcome. Now go out and do what we tell you. Mogadishu is a, a classic example, but the same thing has happened. It's happening in Venezuela. It happened in Haiti. Um, anywhere there's a vacuum, somebody fills the vacuum. So the question we have to ask first and foremost is who is your tribe? If you're gonna organize your community, who is going to be in your tribe? My company motto is training trumps gear, community trumps all. In other words, it's great to have gear, nice to have food storage, nice to have guns and ammo and everything, but if you're not trained on it, it doesn't do you any good. What you've done is stored that stuff for somebody else. And so you gotta have training, but community gives you the economy of scale to defend and protect that you don't have as an individual. So a community organization and plan puts you out in front of anarchy. In other words, with, with the coming chaos that you know is coming, you are already formed into a tribe and you are all ready to act. That's why I think Los Angelinos are gonna have a hard time because there are 180,000 people who are already formed into tribes with command structure, with training, with lots of arms and ammunition, and they will dominate. How do you prevent that from happening? We're gonna talk about that. You have to organize ahead of the event in order to get, a hold of, get ahead of the anarchy. So, how do you organize? Who's in your tribe? It's a pretty simple step. Identify the leaders, identify the needs, identify the resources, and then form teams. We're gonna go through that in greater detail. But who are the leaders? What is your area? What natural boundaries exist? We have a series of communities on Highway 18 here. We have, um, Winchester Hills, kind of a self-contained community. We have Diamond Valley, self-contained community. We have Dameron Valley, self-contained community. We have Veo, self-contained community. We have Central, self-contained community. Pine Valley, self-contained communities. That's a natural border or boundary. But if you live in an urban area, it may be a little harder to delineate where that is. So you might have to uh, look, you know, are there natural boundaries here? There are natural boundaries. 
There's 10 miles between each of those communities. Very easy to say, we're gonna organize Diamond Valley. <clears throat> what kind of man-made boundaries exist? Um, you know, there, are, there may be there may be physical boundaries like railroad tracks or freeways that will help to define your territory, your community. And then one of the big questions is what are the size constraints? How big of a group can you manage effectively? The answer in strict organizational terms is about 500. However, Diamond Valley has about 1,100 people. So we're going to have to stretch it to make that work. Other, other communities, um, you know, you would, you would want to try and limit this to a manageable size. It's really hard to control anything more than 500 people. So, you know, that's something to think about. So there are size constraints that give you efficiency. Who are the leaders? What civil authority exists? Is there law enforcement? Is there military? Here in Diamond Valley, in, in all the communities I just mentioned, the civil authority, since we don't have police departments up here, the civil authority is the fire chief. If anything happens in this community, then the fire chief will be responsible for leading the, leading the charge. Could be, you know, um, there's uh, an element of law enforcement. We have law enforcement in our valley. I think probably all of them, all of you have law enforcement in the other communities I mentioned. Um, so, you know, that might be somewhere there, but you gotta look at who's capable of actually learning or leading the organization. Do they have any people skills? That's a huge factor. I always joke about it, but I think about um, I, I think about the town of Mayberry, and, and Andy Taylor, a guy with great people skills. Right, things never got out of control. Well, it was never designed to. But what kind of knowledge do they have? What kind of people skills? And are they motivated? Those are the questions you have to ask as you pick leaders. Not the smooth tongue, eloquent guy, but the guy who has the real practical knowledge. Really easy to think that. Now you're gonna identify your needs. And I've created a list of categories that you're going to have to, to address. The one that I'm most interested in is security because that's my background. So who, what kind of security do you have? We have to have a, a group or a, a committee to, to take care of sheltering people, of providing water, providing food, of sanitation, medical, communications, energy, and civility. I'll go through all those in, in more detail. Security is a big one to me. Why? What do you gotta be secure from? Encroachment, invasion, annexation. You know, that warlord mentality that says, now you're part of our tribe. No, no, we're not. We're not going to go along with that. So encroachment just means being overrun with refugees. Sadly, we'll have to have, here in this valley, we'll have to have a screening process. And every small community will to decide who's, who we can afford to support and who we can't. And it may mean kicking some people on down the road. I'd like to say I could feed everyone. It'd be great if we could just open our doors and welcome all the refugees from Las Vegas. Because that's where they're coming from. Um, the antidote to encroachment invasion, and invasion could be like a motorcycle gang or uh, uh, another group um, that comes over to try and take your supplies. I don't know if you remember the, the TV show. Um, oh, dang it. Just slipped my mind. Oh, it'll come to me in a second. Anyway, the, one community tried to raid the other community to take all their resources. They had a big fight. 
What the antidote is, is a trained paramilitary force that can enforce borders and protect against attack from outside forces. And it would look something like this. When you provide security for an organization or for a community, you have to provide defense in depth. So you, the community is the Pentagon there. That's kind of ironic. Strange symbol to a pick. Uh, you have outside of the community a secured perimeter. So you have people who are guarding the, the perimeter of the, of the community. You have observation posts and listening posts, OPLPs. The OPLP's job is to look down Highway 18 and look up Highway 18 and look at the other approaches to the valley, for example, in Diamond Valley, and report on any, any movement they see. In a, an urban area, it might be somebody on a roof with a pair of binoculars on one end of the, of the, uh, of the boundaries uh, and somebody on each of the four corners, you know, just sitting on rooftops with the uh, binoculars. QRF, QRF is a quick reaction force. They're highly mobile and they can rush to the scene of any incursion. So 50 bikers show up at the entrance to the valley. The QRF is called and, you know, a whole bunch of Diamond Valley rednecks with hunting rifles show up at the gate. By the way, I'm one of them, so. I'm not making fun of them. And then the last element is the scout element. The scout element patrols outside the boundaries, considerable distance, looking for any indication of enemy movement. So that's kind of how you would design security for your, for your community. Um, it's it's got to be adaptable to whatever your environment is. This is an ideal design for this environment, for Diamond Valley. You know, we could we could pull this off with that, without it. We might have more OPLPs, um, but you know, you can you can imagine an observation post on each of the two volcanoes, and another one on the backside of the mountain over here, and and they've got good oversight of everything that's happening. Radio response, and then the last the last response, last year's response is what we call a citizen response, which means everybody and their brother gets whatever weapons they have and turns out, the Minuteman. And that's just everyone. You know, this is, this is uh, hopefully not gonna happen because if your scouts and your OPs are doing their job, then you won't be surprised. If that, and that's the idea. All right, so security is a big thing for me. You have to have somebody who is in charge of, or a committee that's in charge of finding shelter. Everybody needs protection from the elements. Everybody needs safe, safety and security, and they need privacy. It's, those are human needs. And um, you know, it's not gonna go well if, if people are living in palatial houses while other people are sleeping in the irrigation ditches. You've got, to, you've got to take care of housing. You have to have a source of water. Here's our biggest problem in Diamond Valley. We, have, we depend on well water that is pumped with electric pumps. If anything happens to the electricity, we have to go to back up diesel. How long can we run on diesel? Maybe six months, maybe two months. I don't know. Depends on what people are willing to part with. There's a whole bunch of people here with diesel tanks, 500 gallon tanks. So we might be able to keep them going a ways, a while. However, I have to commend Dameron Valley, the next valley up, because they just converted their electric pumps to solar pumps. And all of their power, all of their water is delivered by solar powered pumps. That's ideal. Why? It's sustainable. It's independent. Um, I can't, I don't want to start any political landmines, step on any political landmines here, but I have a pretty strong feeling that the county of Washington County 
wants Veo's, Brookside's, Dameron, Diamond, they, they want their water. They want us not to be independent. Can't have it. <laughs> we ain't giving it up. Uh, some form of water storage. Most of the communities I've mentioned have million gallon tanks full of water, which as long as you're refilling it, it works. It provides water pressure and, and so forth. But we're gonna have to change uh, a lot of water consumption will be one of the first things we'll have to address. You're gonna have to stop taking 20 minute showers and you're gonna have to stop flushing the toilet 30 times a day. There's a lot more I could say about that, but I probably should, should not. Be ready to purify water if it's necessary. Um, you can purify on an individual basis. There's a lot of ways to do water purification, kind of outside the realm of, of our organization, but somebody who's in charge of water is gonna to have to come up with the ways of purifying massive amounts of water. Not that hard. Someone's gonna be responsible for food. Now this is, a, this is a touchy area because I'm willing to bet that I've, I've got a lot of food stored. I'm willing to bet that people who have no food stored are suddenly going to become socialists when there's no food in their cupboard. Oh, we have to share all our food. Like I said before, this has to depend on choice. If I choose to give people my food, that's a different thing than if you come and demand that I give it to you. If you try and take my food, I will end you. But if you ask me nicely, I'll give it to you. Someone's gonna have to figure out how to do food. Do we distribute food to each individual home? Do we do a community or collective meals? That's more efficient. We'll have to have gardens. One of the topics on the, in this lecture series coming up soon will be how to do gardens. You won't live for very long if you don't have a way of, of providing your own food. So food preservation, how do you store the food? You grow all winter, you bottle and can it, put it in a root cellar and eat it all winter. So we did it when I was a kid, we had a root cellar and we had fruit trees and, and vines and all kinds of stuff. And every year we had cherries, we had apricots, we had peaches, we go, I'd go out and, get, and pick the dang things on its three-legged ladder and um, bring in the buckets and my mom would process them, bottle them, can them. And we had a, a shelf that looked like that in our, and, and all through the winter we ate the vegetables and the fruit that we canned, that we grew in the summer and canned. A lot of people say, oh, well, I'll just go hunting. With everybody in the valley or everybody in the region hunting for deer, how long do you think the deer population is gonna last? They'll either become really wise or we'll slaughter them all. It's a very short-term approach. You have to have something other than that. Now, fortunately we have, <laughs> one of the most commonly asked questions I get from, from people is, if you were starving, would you eat your dog? And my answer is no, but I'll eat yours. <laughs> at some point, you know, if things got desperate enough, you're going to have to start looking at other sources of protein. I hope we're good enough not to have to do that as a community. I hope we are. And I hope you can figure that out as well. So there's stored food, which gets you through till you get gardens going and then can start preserving food. If you do gardening right, you should have surplus, plenty of surplus to bottle up. I mean, I, I was always amazed at our little three quarter acre plot in, in Bountiful produced as much as it did. We had a garden in the very back that produced corn and eggplants and I never ate eggplants, but 
we had a lot of them. Um, and tomatoes galore. We had a lot of produce. It was a hard work. My dad was out there every day. Not me, I couldn't be found anywhere near the garden. Much to my father's consternation. Another committee that you're going to have to organize is sanitation. You're going to have to figure out how to deal with garbage. We have these nice little trucks that come and pick up two dumpster, two big dumpster loads worth of your garbage every, every week. What if that ceases? Well, when I was a kid growing up in Bountiful, once again, we had burn barrels. And you took all of your, everything down and put it in the, the burn barrel. Metal, everything. And you burned up the cans out and flattened them. And then I remember, I remember that my dad um, cut the bottom and top off of all the number 10 cans that we used, flattened them, and made shingles out of them. So, you know, you're going to have to figure out a lot of repurposing. But burn barrels were just, a, you know, and then air quality got to be an issue. I, I think when the grid goes down, air quality is not going to be our primary concern. And so people will be using burn barrels. I mean, I think it's a really efficient way to deal with most waste. Big issue is going to be human waste disposal. Diamond Valley has about 1,100 people. Assuming that every person in the valley produces one to two pounds of human waste a day, we're talking about a ton of poop every day. Where's that going? You're going to have to set up a a bucket relay and take it up and dump it in the volcano. I don't know. No. We, yeah. Well, yeah. No, we are on, we're on septic here. So with septic, all we have to do is use our septic tanks for waste disposal. You have to put water in the toilet to get it to flush. If water is in short supply, we're gonna to have to come up with another solution. For me, that solution is to go out into my backyard, dig around until I find the cap to the septic system, dig around it, pull it out, and put a toilet box on the top of it so that I can drop directly into the septic tank. Eliminates the middleman. No more toilets inside. You're also going to want to recycle all the gray water you can. Anything that comes out of your sink or, or any, anything that you would normally just wash away needs to go into your garden. You have to, you have to start really thinking efficiently. Um, I have a couple of composting toilets that I made um, with big blue barrels, 55-gallon barrels, and um, it produces humanure. Now, some people would be squeamish about eating produce that was produced using humanure. I am not one of those. Hey, it's, it's composted. It's no longer poop. It's now compost. And it works astonishingly well. You know, composting toilets are something to think about. One of the big issues is that there will be a large number of people, I should say a large number, but there will be a number of people who without access to medication and medical care will not survive. I wish I could say everyone's going to live, but you know, type 1 diabetics are going to have a really hard time after two months when their insulin runs out. Uh, there's a number of people on heart medication or uh, blood pressure medication, and they're going to stroke out. So somebody need, uh, you need to have somebody in charge of burying the bodies and registering the grave so that we know where people are. So that if things ever return to normal, their next of kin can come in and if they want to exhume the body or at least pay respects to it. So there will have to be you know, some place set aside for the, for the burial of bodies. That's an important community service. Nobody wants to do that. I mean, I'm not volunteering, but it has to be done. 
So you're gonna to have to have part of your sanitation committee, the responsibility for, for burial. Medical, this is a big one. Now there's two approaches to this. Anybody here with any medical training? Yeah. So the, one, of the, one of the approaches is to have a centralized hospital tent with gurneys and IV bags and everything you need on site. The other approach is a distributed one where the doctors go out and make house calls like the old days. They take what they need with them. And how you decide to fix that is gonna depend on what resources you have. I mean, a hospital tent, if you've ever been in a hospital, military hospital tent, they're freaking huge. We had a tent down in, in um, I guess it wasn't New Orleans, it was in uh, Baton Rouge. We had a tent there that would, that would easily have covered a football field. Whoa, I'm sure uh, Larry and Jerry and, and uh, uh, any of you military guys have seen big tents. You know, and, and I don't have one of those. I got a 10 by 12 cabin tent, that's it. You know, a little hunting lodge tent. I, it would hold exactly one person in a bed. So that's probably not gonna work. You're probably gonna be going with the distributed model. You might centralize the supplies and then have nurses and doctors go out and treat people as needed. It's gonna be old school medicine, meaning no x-rays, no CAT scans, you know, none of the, none of the imaging or, or you know, what they can do today with the technology in a hospital is astonishing. You know, when they put a stent in, they cut your wrist and they slide a, go up into your heart and put a stent in the, it's just amazing. Uh, that's not gonna happen. One of my friends said, hey, I've got a, a deal for you. I've got an AED, an automatic electronic defibrillator, if you want it. I said, I don't think it'll do me any good. He said, really? I said, yeah, because if someone has a heart attack and I pop them with a defibrillator, then what? There's no ICU to put them in. There's nobody, no cardiologist. There's no drugs to, to treat that. So we have old school medicine Right, I mean, there, there's some pretty fascinating things. I don't know if I talked about it in the trauma class, but you know, old time doctors, you know, 19th century doctors had a tuning fork in their bag and they would hit the tuning fork and put the end of it on a potentially broken bone. And if the guy jumped off the table, then you knew the bone was broken. <laughs> it was kind of destructive testing in a way. <laughs> You know, but that's the kind of medicine it will be relegated to. We have, we'll have a limited supply of antibiotics. Uh, maybe we'll have a pretty good supply of essential oils. Now, I think essential oils are great, right? I, I'm a big believer, but their limitation is, I have, a, I have a, a, a poster that someone printed for me. It says, it shows an army medic treating a guy. He says, John, I'm sorry you lost your leg but don't worry, I put some lavender oil on it. You know, it all has its place. It's, it has its place. Triage will be hard. The, the medical professionals will have the hardest decision to decide whether or not um, to save, try and save someone's life. Because attempting to save someone who's gravely injured may use up a whole lot of resources and still not be able to save them. They're going to have to make the call of, is this person, can I save this person? You know, if you get shot in the gut with a, a 308, unless you have a surgeon on hand who knows how to go in and resect bowels and, and sew up kidneys and, and what have you, the guy's gonna die. So you're gonna make him comfortable, called palliative care, Make them comfortable until the time comes to go. I mean, this is the stuff the medical profession deals with 
in a minimal way now because they can just keep throwing resources at anybody. They, and they do in a lot of cases. But if the situation is dire where you have limited resources, then you have to start, you know, and I hear, I hear this all the time. Well, now you're playing God. No, I'm thinking of the overall good of the community. I'm trying to preserve resources so that I can save the most amount of people. Those of you with medical training uh, will understand what I'm talking about. It's not going to be fun. I, I don't envy the medical people. Communications. There's a couple of gurus sitting in this classroom right now. Really good um, comms guys. Yeah, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you, Herman, um, who really understand radio. Ham radio will be very useful for communicating between the five communities between uh, and then gathering news from outside of the area. That's, that's the advantage of having ham radios. And we have a bunch of ham radios around. Who here has a ham license? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, that's about right. Yeah, who has ham radios? Yeah, I haven't taken the test. I have the radios. I figure by the time I need the radios, the test, the, the licensure isn't going to matter. Plus, I just, don't, I just I don't like government control. Local communications will be done with little handheld walkie-talkies. That's probably the best you can do. Or, or some VHF uh, commercial handheld radios, the Motorola's. Um, those are great, actually. They're expensive. About 250 bucks a piece, but you can get ham radios for 25 handheld ham radios for 25, 30 bucks, and the FRS radios are way overrated, but they could be useful for inter-community communications. Um, you're going to have to have some way of keeping the batteries charged. Therefore, solar panels. I'll talk about that in a minute. Are probably your best option, but there are other options as well. And then finally. Because you won't be able to log on to the Diamond Valley Friends website anymore because the internet won't exist, you will have, will have to have a community news board where people can put up uh, and, a, and a community barter board. Hey, I have uh, two dozen extra eggs. Anybody want to trade for some corn on the cob? That kind of thing. Being able to communicate is going to be really important. So. News board, you know, the ham radio, yes. I just wanted to inject if there is a legitimate emergency that where life or severe property damage is uh, going to be caused because of, you know, of the severe flood, okay. If there's ham radio equipment available, uh, you can legally use it. If it's an emergency and you don't have a license, so I encourage anybody that has friends that have ham radios to have them show them the proper way to use them or turn them on or whatever. So if you had to get a message out and it is a legitimate emergency or life-threatening situation, then it's okay. You can use so the, that radio equipment uh, for an emergency. What, what he said for those of you on Zoom is that uh, ham radio licensure requirements are um, I guess you get a pass if there's a life-threatening emergency so that um, you can use the radio without the license. It would be good to know how to use it. So it's probably a good idea to learn. Yeah. Yep. But see, this is where the division of labor comes in. I don't like radios. I just don't like them. I got this, my father-in-law passed away recently and he was one of the tremendously good uh, ham radio operators around. I mean, he, he's, a, he's what, they, they, what you call an Elmer. And I inherited, my wife and I inherited you know, unbelievable amount of test equipment. Herman came and looked at it and, and radios and receivers and antennas and 
power amps and just, and I look at it and go, meh, somebody else needs to figure this out because I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I know, I know, I should be more diligent. But uh, being able to share information will become critical in a, in a it, the, the, it's called the need for knowledge or the need for information. The felt need for information, it's a sociology term. It says in a crisis, there's a very strong felt need for information. People want to know what's going on. Why are we doing this? What's happening? So you'll have to have some way of distributing information. Energy. You got to keep some electrical um, appliances or whatever operational. For me, it's being able to recharge my drills, my power tools. And I can't imagine life having to use a screwdriver. Really, that, that, would, be the, that would be the end of. Um, so, solar, solar power panels for running your radios. Um, there are other options. Wind is an option. You see the picture out, up there of the wind turbine made with snow shovels. I thought that was brilliant. Uh, we have a, I teach a class called Scout Engineering, which we do this kind of stuff, where we, we, we make things. All you need for that is four snow shovels, um, uh, an axle, pillar blocks to hold it, and then a big gear on the, a small gear on the bottom of the, of the uh, turbine and a big gear on your generator. And you can crank out electricity. With just a, and guess what? It, the wind blows up here a lot. If you got that thing 20 feet up, it would blow all the time. There's a tower over here, the, the repelling tower. It's a very cool tower. But if you look at the flag on that thing, it is always straight because it's up 50, 60 feet. So one of the things you want to do is collect all the unused car batteries. If people's cars are dead, like after an EMP, get everybody's battery. And then use those for storage. It's just as important to be able to store the electricity you generate as it is to generate it. And battery, car batteries would fill the bill for a while. Um, and then use passive solar as much as possible. I have this six foot parabolic dish that's covered with mylar. And at the apex of it, there's a picture of it. The apex heats to about 800 degrees. So, and it has a platform to hold a pan. So I can put a, a big pot of water on there and boil it and have continuously purified water all day without spending a single BTU of, of any kind of gas. It's completely passive. Solar is passive as well, but it, it, you know, it requires a an, an, pretty good investment. This parabolic thing is pretty awesome. And by the way, solar has made, in the last two years, solar has made amazing advances in terms of efficiency. So you need fewer panels and you don't have to chase the sun with them. And I mean, they're really getting good now. I imagine there's stuff out there that's even better. The last thing I want to talk about is, is civility. This is going to take two different forms. One is the fact that people won't always behave well. Right? There'll be people in any community who act out. It could be alcohol related. It could be um, theft. It could be anything. You're going to have to come up with some form of community policing and some form of adjudication. I go back to Mayberry. Andy was the police chief or the sheriff, but he was also the justice of the peace. So if you violated the law, you appeared before him. He was the magistrate, so to speak, and he adjudicated the case. You know, that may be the kind of thing that has to happen. You might have retired police officers or retired MPs that can handle some of the policing, 
but there has to be somebody who, who decides what to do with them. So civility, that's an interesting aspect of civility. The other is maintaining social interaction. There is a felt need for information, but there's also a felt need to connect. One of the worst things about this pandemic has been the isolation it has put people under. I used to live in a little town in Eastern New Mexico called Hobbs, New Mexico. God forsaken place. I mean, honestly, it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. And um, the, the entire, there was nothing to do. It was so flat, you couldn't go on a hike because it was just flat. There was not a, a wadi or a river or anything like that anywhere in the area. You just, it was just flat everywhere. The, the entire social structure of the community revolved around their basketball team. They had a championship basketball team. When I got there, they had won 10 state championships in a row. I mean, it was, it was the best basketball program in the country. Well, I just read a really interesting article. Along comes COVID. New Mexico institutes the harshest shutdown rules in the country and shuts down all schooling and sports. And for Hobbes, that was a death sentence. Because what happened over the course of the, of the fall when they realized they weren't gonna go back to school, weren't gonna play sports, is that there was a epidemic of suicide among the young people because they're so isolated. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't do anything. They were completely isolated. Interestingly enough, it's right on the Texas border, literally 100 yards from the border to Texas. Across the border in a number of little oil towns that were exactly identical to Hobbs, they did not institute a shutdown in the fall. They lifted the restrictions, now they're completely lifted. They resume sports and in-school classroom. You would say, well, I'll bet you they had a much higher infection rate. They had exactly the same infection rate as Hobbs did, but no suicides. Isolation is devastating. I am so opposed to the isolation that is being imposed upon us by our federal government. I just refuse to do it. I don't wear and won't wear a mask. Am I at risk? I don't think so. I don't think there's any greater risk if you wear a mask or not. Didn't mean to get down that rat hole. Sorry, I'll get back on the topic of civility. Social interaction is gonna be critical. That was my point, is we have to have some way of interacting with the other people in the community. So you will have to have gatherings for recreation. I mean, we have pickleball, we have volleyball courts, we have basketball courts. We'll have to have recreational leagues. Can't be run by the LDS church though. Because LDS church basketball is the only basketball game. It's the only fight that starts with a prayer. <laughs> so, but worship services are gonna be important. People are gonna to wanna to go to church. People are gonna to wanna to associate, hang out. You wanna have dinner parties or, you know, food store dinner parties. We're gonna have a, a class coming up on how to prepare stored food. That's one of our topics. That's one you don't wanna miss. Because trust me, eating cracked wheat cereal for 365 straight days will get to you. It'll kill you. You're gonna to wanna to keep a supply of board games and puzzles. Now, I say that in all, in all jest, but when I was a kid, my mother was a depression era woman. She, you know, she grew up in the depression and every day for breakfast, I ate cracked wheat cereal, which was the most God awful, <laughs> terrible mush in the world. And the only way I could the only way I could uh, eat it is if I put equal amounts of white sugar on it. <laughs> so I was eating, 
I killed my pancreas just being forced to eat cracked wheat cereal. I used to hide it. I used to tell her I ate it and hide the bowl. She'd find it behind the curtains. Or she, one day she went to, to uh, uh, a young women's activities and opened her purse, and there was my bowl of cereal. <laughs> I hated that stuff. And I'm telling you, it was food fatigue. I get it now still with just not eating a lot of processed foods. I, I just get so bored with what I have to eat. So, you know, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to deal with that. Mm. Is it a PDF? We can put it on the website. That, that would, yeah, that would be good. Yep. But you know, you have things to do. Um, <coughs> kids who've grown up with this attached to their hands, I always joke that the next evolutionary development in the human body will be oversized thumbs, <laughs> right? They're going to have a really hard time separating from technology. So Jerry has this great idea. He's going to print out cardboard game controllers <laughs> and they can pretend, <laughs> stare at a blank screen and pretend they're playing. Those are going to be issues you're going to have to deal with. People are going to be people who have been entertained their whole lives are going to have a hard time figuring out how to entertain themselves. Have books on hand. Lots of good books. Fun books for teenagers to read. My wife grew up reading Nancy Drew. I grew up reading Hardy Boys. I mean, those were awesome for me at that at the age of 10. Edgar Rice Burroughs, mm, that was another good one. Yes, Those are the, these are the classics that our kids have never heard of. No, they don't have any idea, any idea. And, and so they're gonna get, have to get into those things. I'm not a, a great fan of the Harry Potter books. I actually read them all, but what I appreciate about them is they got kids reading. I read them, they were entertaining. Got kids reading. So come up with ways to uh, entertain, socially interact, have classes on specialized subjects. Have somebody who knows how to make quilts do quilt making classes. Have someone who knows how to shoot a bow do archery classes. I mean, there's a bunch of that kind of stuff that most of us would learn if we had the time. But now that we're working 60 hours a week, we just don't ever take the time to learn those things. Well, guess what? We might suddenly have a whole lot of time on our hands. And now will be the time to learn. Herman here can teach you long distance shooting. There's a bunch of skills that you could start to really develop. And you're gonna need that stuff. I mean, I'm not sure how, what well, quilting could save your life keep you warm. All right, civility. In summary, organize now. Don't wait until the event happens because then it's too late. In terms of self-defense, I want to mention a few books. This is one of my favorite books. It's called Left of Bang. It was written by a couple of uh, guys in, at the tracking school that I trained. And a lot of this is, is stuff that I, de that I developed uh, when I started On Point. But it's a great book on awareness. The concept of Left of Bang is that when an event happens, the bang, where is our attention focused? It's focused right of bang on the timeline. We focus on what to do after the event occurs. Left of Bang says, what are the indicators that something's going to happen and how can we prepare for them in advance? What is left of bank? That is awareness. The best definition I've heard of awareness is that awareness gives you time. The purpose of, of practicing awareness is to develop the ability to respond ahead of the bang. Being aware gives you time to do that. 
So awareness is a really important thing. Um, this is a, a new book. I'm halfway through it called Prairie Fire by Clay Martin, Green Beret on organizing rural communities. It's a very good book. This is his first book on organizing in urban communities. It's called Concrete Jungle, Clay Martin. Concrete Jungle. Uh, there's a whole series of these books and they are among my favorites. The Reluctant Partisan series by uh, John Mosby. That is not his real name, obviously, but um, he'd be very, very old if it was him. Uh, John Mosby has, this is a great book on guerrilla activity, the reluctant partisan. Partisans have made a huge difference in, in a lot of wars. In World War II, we put uh, partisan teams, we put American soldiers were inserted into um, enemy behind enemy lines to organize partisan groups to do sabotage and assassinations. It's a very, very successful unit. This is a book on how to conduct guerrilla warfare. We've been the victim of guerrilla warfare um, and sometimes we have used it successfully. In World War II, we used it very successfully against the Germans. We had a program called the Jedbergs. They were trained by SOE, which was the British Special Operations Executive, their, their predecessor to MI6. And they were trained and dropped in behind enemy lines to organize huge resistance against the Nazis. Very successful. Jerry's father was a Jedburg. This book is very hard to find now. It's out of print. But he's written two new ones, which I don't have yet. I'm getting them soon. This one's called A Failure of Civility. And it's on essentially how to defend and protect you, your family, your neighborhoods by Jack Lawson. Jack Lawson just wrote a two volume set that is an expansion on this. I don't have it yet. Um, a friend of mine is supposed to send it to me, but he hasn't yet. And so I'm not, I put off, hold it, held off buying it. These books are great references for how to defend a community, how to organize and protect. I don't like to use the word defend. I like to use the word protect. Defense means you're reacting to them and you're behind them in the OODA loop. Def uh, protecting means you might be giving it to them really good before they have a chance to get to you. Uh, so it's a, it's a different mentality. All right. Um, I hope uh, I kind of flew through that. I hope it was useful. Um, is there any questions either on Zoom or um, from anybody here? Yeah. From Zoom, can you hold up that token in the last one and just give the author one more time? Yep, it's called The Failure of Civility by Jack Lawson. Jack's in a, a Green Beret. He used to live here. Is he still here, Larry? No, he moved out of Arizona. Yeah, he lived here for a while. We used to have breakfast with him all the time. Um, and... Uh, um, he's got a new two volume set out, the name of which I didn't look up. I, I, I kind of forgot it. So any other questions, comments, observations? 